A while back on our Facebook page, you posted a very thoughtful piece on the passing of Terry Jones. Of, yes. Of Monty Python fame. I was thinking about Monty Python. And the reason why they've endured is that each of them has one part of themselves that they do better than the other five. John Cleese is the star. His boldness and his stage presence really drives that show. Michael Palin is the best comedian. Comic timing, joke delivery, all that stuff. Also the most charming. Everyone loves Michael Palin. Yeah. Eric Idle is the wittiest mm-hmm. wordplay and the you know complex delivery and, and also all the songs. Graham Chapman is the best actor. Mm-hmm. So any, even the silliest characters, he's able to imbue them with this humanity that makes them that much more deeper. Terry Gilliam is the weirdest of them. Mm-hmm. And arguably the reason why anyone is even talking about Monty Python today. Because I think those opening credits, those animations that he did, that's really the style of the show. And that's really what made people sit up and notice. In the psychedelic era, it went beyond psychedelia. This is what psychedelics were trying to do, and he was the guy who figured out how to do it. Right, right. And our dearly departed Terry Jones was the most versatile of them. He just did a thousand characters and a thousand voices, and a lot of time you do them once and never again. And he was also the director of the three movies. That's where his legacy truly lies. Yeah. How do we wrap that up? (laughs) (laughs) I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. I hope you had a nice Valentine's Day, Craig. Yes, I hope I did too. Well, Valentine's Day is still going on here in the basement where we indulge in our longest running tradition of watching a romantic movie around Valentine's Day. Today's movie incorporates something that you don't often associate with romance, and that's divorce. Can romance thrive when a relationship is ended? Tonight we find out the awful truth. No! Oh! I have not seen this. Cary Grant, guys! Released in 1937, T.A.T. stars Cary Grant, Irene Dunn, and Basement alum Ralph Bellamy. Uh, That that fellow looks like Ralph Bellamy. It was based on the 1923 play of the same name and directed by Leo McCary, who would go on to win the Oscar for it. Much of the dialogue and comedic elements were improvised by the director and the actors, mainly because McCary didn't like the script. This turned out to be Grant's breakout role, establishing him as an A-list movie star. The Wire Fox Terrier in this movie is none other than Skippy, the same pooch who portrayed Asta in the Thin Man films. It's so weird when you see dog stars in different movies. (laughs) I've said on this show before that I saw another movie with Toto in it, right? Yeah, you did. Yeah. And he did like another dozen movies after Wizard of Oz. Sure. For which he was billed as Toto. Huh. He had a more successful career, I think, than Burt Lahr. The Awful Truth was made as a silent film back in 1925, starring Basement alum and Shark Island inmate Warner Baxter Mm. in the lead role. This film was selected for preservation in the National Film Archive in 1996, and it is the the 27th film featured on our show to have achieved such a distinction. Divorce is a hell of a thing. I don't wish it on anybody. But once you've gone through it, afterwards, all you can really do is try and pick up the pieces. And if you're in a situation like that, you might want some practice. Pick up sticks. Classic game from antiquity. This is wonderful. From antiquity. (laughs) As long as there have been (laughs) sticks, children have been playing with them. So there's another little fun game you can teach your son. I have to learn how to play it myself. Just drop them and you pick them up. That's why it was fun back during antiquity. Yes. Darling, won't you join us on the old leather couch where we're having a little soiree as we watch The Awful Truth. Dun, 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 dun. I like it when the opening credits are a book. I know, because then you can be like, I don't know, a movie's a low art form. But I'm getting a book reading done. <laughs> Jerry Warner has just returned from Florida. Or so his wife thinks. And what wives don't know won't hurt them. Wait a minute. I didn't take this into consideration for the last few years of my marriage. Okay. Well, I'll see you later, Jerry. Come on, Frank. I'm off to get some shorter shorts. Him and a bunch of his high society friends go back to his mansion to meet up with his wife, Lucy. He finds out from the housekeeper that his wife is out. But you know who is home? Mr. Smith, the dog. 
You might recognize him from the picture shows. He is a playful scamp. Lucy comes back home. And she's not really dressed appropriately for a mid-afternoon gathering. I just killed a polar bear on the way in. (laughs) And she's with a guy. And they just got home. But you see, this is her music teacher, Armand Duval. (laughs) Armand's car broke down last night a million miles from nowhere. We were orbiting Pluto. (laughs) We were forced to spend the night elsewhere. What's going on with you and this piano player? No, your wife. Oh, she was the loveliest woman in the park. And she is a uh, fantastic in the, the sack. <laughs> you know, uh, your husband is not like the average American man. He's yes. clearly yes. English, <laughs> but covering it up with a funny voice. Larry suspects. Larry's not his name. Jerry suspects this entire thing. Why should Jerry be angry? I didn't build the car. Henry Ford, the anti Semite, built the car. <laughs> Little Nutmeg. Please, please. Little Nutmeg is my Christmas-themed rapper alter ego. Well, you don't all have to go, do you? Go? No. I'm going to stay here and make love to your wife. Everybody leaves because it's awkward. There, that's some classic Cary Grant, not sitting in a chair right. (laughs) Say, you hungry? No, not hungry. Czechoslovakia. I am a great teacher, not a great lover. That's right, Omar. You're not a great lover. You're entirely adequate. You get the job done, but not done done. Not like... Irene done. Yes. (laughs) I will see you soon. Big a baboon. (laughs) Then she looks at the fruit basket. Those aren't Florida oranges. Who knows what he was off doing? These two just can't trust each other, and they decide that it's time to get a divorce. The divorce proceedings go smoothly enough. Who gets to keep the dog? That was a muff trick. Lucy's hanging out with her Aunt Patsy. I thought we were going to go out on the town. You're just sitting here moping around. Well, let's live some life, says the old lady. She runs into Daniel Leeson in the elevator. I think I'm going to set up Lucy with this man. Who also happens to be a multi-millionaire. He owns oil fields, he owns cattle, and he's from Oklahoma! Everyone's hitting it off well, and who should knock at the door but Jerry? It's his day to visit Mr. Smith. And Jerry doesn't like the fact that this strange man is here, with Lucy, who he's technically still married to, for the next 60 days. Why don't you go and play with the dog? Why don't you go, uh... On with whatever you were doing. (laughs) Jerry's determined to be a nuisance. (laughs) Goodbye, Jerry. Uh, goodbye, Warner. The best way to show contempt for someone you just met is to address them by their last name. (laughs) With no mister in front of them. At a swell nightclub, Jerry's out on a date with Dixie Bell. She's a showgirl. Lucy and Daniel show up at that same club, and at this point, they are engaged. This is awkward, and they decide to make it more awkward by all sitting together. (laughs) Dixie Bell goes up, and she sings a song that's embarrassing, and that involves wind. My dreams are gone with the wind Once my love and I Jerry goes and sees Lucy and Daniel. Jerry owns a coal mine, and since they're both working in very dirty energy, Jerry thought that maybe him and Dan should get together on a little business deal. At the end of a hard day when she goes home, she sits in her favorite chair and she says, Irene, done. Nothing's going to hurt me anymore. (laughs) No ceiling is going to collapse on me anymore. (laughs) Ah! (laughs) Daniel knocks on the door and Jerry ends up being trapped behind it started writing poetry to you. Oh, oh dear. Well, I was going to surprise The universal poetry reaction. He reads it to her. It's a really crappy poem. Oh, you would make my life divine if you would change your name to mine. Took a dime, drank some wine, and now you look like Frankenstein. The phone rings. It's Armand. Jerry's suspicions are reignited. He decides to go and try and catch him in the act. He's met by the manservant. They have a little jujitsu fight. You must not go in. You must not disturb me. Very naked. Very naked. He bursts in and finds out that it's a recital. There's nothing going on between them at all. At least not now. <laughs> Shoot, I missed that. Go hide your eyes and I'll give it to you that way. Go on, hide your eyes. Go hide your eyes. Oh, wow. Asta. 
the master. Later on, Lucy confesses that she doesn't want to marry Daniel. Because I'm still in love with that crazy lunatic and there's nothing I can do about it. Crazy lunatic. Hitler. <laughs> I know that Mr. Jerry does not like me and I fear the next time he comes around. There's another knock on the door. It's Jerry. No. Yes, it's Jerry. Duvel hides in the back room. But there's two hats. It's all right. Just tell him that Renee Magritte is visiting. <laughs> so she's got to hide the hat. But Mr. Smith is a curious pooch. And he keeps finding the hat in all the hiding places that she puts the hat in. <laughs> Jerry puts it on. This hat is way too big. This is not my hat. There's a hat. Mix him up. It's the Annie Hall look. You look great. Dan shows up. Now Jerry's got to hide. He goes and hides in the room that Duvel is hiding in. They forgot to touch second. And they forgot their hats. I, I would have written that line. <laughs> Daniel is disappointed. Love on the rocks, as Neil Diamond once sang about. The days and weeks go by. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Wait, did the dog just read the paper? Oh. Jerry has started dating Barbara Vance. The Barbara Vance. She's another gazillionaire. When you dated someone, there would be a newspaper article about you. This is how it was back in the 30s. You know what it's called when you make a pass at Barbara Vance? And Ed Vance. <laughs> they become engaged. Lucy has patched things up with Daniel, and they're engaged as well. Well, let's drink to our future. 1938. It's flat. It's flat. I'm eating Daniel. Daniel Tiger. He's such a sweet little kid, but sometimes he gets frustrated. But then he remembers to count to four. <laughs> okay, Dad. <laughs> Lend an ear, I implore you. This comes from my heart. I'll always adore you. Fart. Oh, call a car. Hello, car here. This is Caleb Carr, writer of The Alienist. <laughs> She answers the phone when she shouldn't. Who's this, may I ask? It's Barbara Vance. Hello, darling. Are you two-timing me? Well, it's really very simple, dear. It's my sister. I'd love to meet your sister. Why don't you bring her along tonight? Oh, uh, ooh, 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 I'm not sure. No, I don't think she can come over this evening. No, she, she has syphilis. <laughs> She's dying. She's dying. She's waiting. Penicillin isn't invented for a few years. At that party in the country. Who should show up but Lucy pretending to be Jerry's sister. And she's pretending to be drunk. She's so crass. <laughs> I haven't been felt like that since the Roosevelt administration. The last one. <laughs> but they don't know the half of it because she's going to do that Gone with the Wind number. My dreams have gone with the wind. Get it? <laughs> da -da -da -da, gone with the wind. Woo! <laughs> Jerry gets her out of there. Where do you think you're going? I don't know, but I'm going with wind. Right. She's going to go to the cabin to visit her father. You're not driving. You're too drunk. I'm going to drive you. They go to the cabin. They meet Dad. And they put on their borrowed bed clothes. And they go to sleep in separate rooms. And the latch on the door doesn't work so well. Obviously, they've been having second thoughts. Things are different, except in a different way. So long as I'm different, don't you think that, well, maybe things could be the same again? All right. Who's watching Mr. Smith? And that clock's not helping either. It does this. The sequence provided by David Lynch. <laughs> More door hijinks. The reason the door keeps blowing open is because of the window. I mean, he wants the door to keep blowing open, so he opens that window. But there's a cat that's preventing it. That there is a feline cock block. Finally, the door blows open, and Jerry... Says, the door's blowing open. Prop a chair against it so it won't blow open. And he does. Now they're both on the same side of the door. Oh, yeah. Even the clock is getting in on the sex. <laughs> and now you know the awful truth. <laughs> Who's watching Mr. Smith? The Awful Truth. A not awful movie. No, no, it was pretty good. What do you think are the biggest strengths of Cary Grant? He's got impeccable timing. He's a brilliant physical actor. 
He's got diction more than anyone else. They say about him that he played Cary Grant so long that he finally became Cary Grant. That's really the definition of a movie star. And I thought Irene Dunn was a good foil for him. I thought she was okay. But when she did that sister act, mm -hmm. I think that was when she really shone. It was really the end of the movie that cemented her performance. Just the longing and desire that she has when she's in bed at the end of the movie. Yeah. There's so many things you couldn't say sexually in 1937 on film. And she was saying so much just with her eyes. It was a very tense and erotic scene. Ralph Bellamy plays the perfect sap. He plays characters that you don't want them to not get what they want, but you're glad when they don't. Ralph Bellamy to screwball comedies is what James Marsden is for superhero movies. This is the other point of the love triangle that the other man is Wolverine or Superman. And back then, Ralph Bellamy. My introduction to the man, of course, was Trading Places. I'm surprised that the term rebound is so old. Do you know what rebound is? I always took it as a basketball term that got yeah. appropriated by dating life. Maybe that play coined the term. Re is a weird suffix. Prefix. Uh, a prefix is a suffix. What? A prefix is a suffix. No, it's not. A suffix can go on either side. Prefix is specifically the front. What are you talking about? It's like saying, that's not a guitar. It's an acoustic guitar. No, it's a guitar. Acoustic is not a, a prefix or a suffix. No, I'm, it's saying, an no adjective. I'm saying that this is, this is different. The word suffix can be used for re or osity. I'm not buying any of this. You're not buying any of it? All right. Well, why is re weird? Well, what does it mean exactly? Do again? Yeah. So. Rerun, rebound, recur. Recur, rewind. But rewinding means that you... Backwards. Yeah. Hmm. We're getting too we're much getting, into, we're getting too off, into words. Yeah. He didn't actually go to Florida. No. What was he doing? I don't think... Was he having an affair? The important thing is that he is caught in a lie. A big lie. Yeah. I was gone for two weeks in Florida. No, you weren't. This movie, when it all comes down to it, called The Awful Truth, is about lying and suspicion. He's lying, and he suspects her. And then throughout the rest of the movie, they have to make up these elaborate lies. Oh, that was my sister. I am his sister. There is something very special about this movie. What's that? Irene Dunn's wardrobe. Mm. Look at those shoulder pads. Small animals could jump to their death straight off that cliff. If she was doing cartwheels in that dress, she could hypnotize you. <laughs> Everything is just like a clown outfit. Maybe it's because it's a comedy. Mm -hmm. And they thought, well, she's a funny character, let's dress her up in funny clothes. Like wearing a Hawaiian shirt if you're a stand-up? Yeah. Hey, if you're going into stand-up, don't wear a Hawaiian shirt. It doesn't make you more funny. People don't do that anymore. They do. <laughs> do they grow? Do they change as characters? I don't know. I don't know if this whole thing isn't going to happen again a year or two down the line. Yeah. Well, we had a good time watching this screwball comedy, and now it's time to screw our balls <laughs> on over to Seen It. <laughs> Seen It. <laughs> We're talking about more Best Picture nominees. We will not be talking about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because we already did that last year on our How to Get Ahead in Advertising episode. You can go back and check that out. And we're also not talking about Little Women because we have not seen it yet. Ocean Sage writes, Have you guys seen Noah Baumbach's Marriage Story? Seen it. Seen it. Punch in a wall. I was always led to believe that this was an incredibly sad and difficult film. And it's not at all. It's I, practically a comedy. I have friends who will not watch this movie because it'll be too close to home for all of them. Well, I mean, I can't speak from the perspective of a divorced person. I know that's a painful process, but they're really doing themselves a disservice. This is, without a doubt, Noah Baumbach's finest film. It is such a nuanced, perfect piece of machinery. And you can kind of see how landmines are being set throughout the first half of the movie for once they do get to the divorce trial. Man, is that scene painful. It's painful because you see these two and you think, can't they just work it all out? They seem to know each other so much. Yeah, but you think the same thing when your friends get divorced, yeah. when your friends break up. Yeah, they probably shouldn't be together. He gave her notes on her performance. Closing night. Closing night. <laughs> and he cheated on her. Adam Driver is the handsomest ugly man alive. I don't know. Willem Dafoe's still out there. <laughs> Willem Dafoe's a little long in the tooth. I know, which only makes him more handsome and more ugly. <laughs> 
and an Oscar for Laura Dern. Adam Fink, 1917, was hands down one of the best films I've seen in years. The cinematography sucks you in and doesn't <laughs> let you go by the very end. Seen it. <laughs> seen it. He just made the most wrong <laughs> statement of all time. Oh, there's more words. <laughs> I have to admit, I went into 1917 wanting to hate 1917. And man, did I not. Yeah. The cinematography does suck you in. The flaw of it, though, is that it takes a little bit. In the beginning, it does feel like a gimmick. Mm -hmm. Like, why are we doing all this walking? If we could just cut, we could get right to the meeting. But as soon as the boys embark on their journey out of the trenches... Mm -hmm suddenly you realize that the technique not only serves the story, the technique is the story. Yeah. Because nothing can make World War One more real to an audience than having to take every step through No Man's Land along with these two kids. Yeah. Hell is just a short walk away from a nice peaceful field. I asked Tona if she wanted to come to the mo movies and watch this movie with me. And her response when she heard the title was, is that the movie where he has to run? And it is. It's a movie where he has to run. And Andrew Scott is in this. He plays Lieutenant Leslie in the beginning. A hot priest. Yeah. I think that guy is going to become one of the great English actors. He's mm -hmm. so good. He does that little bit where he uses the whiskey as like a Catholic mm -hmm. thing, and he, and he sort of chuckles. He looks like a man who is no longer capable of feeling mirth, but he remembers how to smile. <laughs> Roger Deakins is now going to become the Boston Red Sox of the Oscars. He didn't win for decades, and now they're just tossing cinematography Oscars at him because he deserves it. But at the same time, pretty soon we're going to be like, oh, Christ. Deacons again. Yeah, again. Monsieur Claw writes, I really want these guys to comment on the recently released South Korean Parasite. Described at Cannes as the most interesting recipient of the Palme d'Or since Pulp Fiction. Poverty causes people to commit atrocities. Mm -hmm. Affluence causes people to ignore atrocities. Mm -hmm. The irony of this film is that the scam this family is running on this rich family, they're really not victimizing the rich people. They're victimizing their fellow poor people whose jobs they're taking. And the jobs in which they're fine at. Except you shouldn't kiss your 2T. Yeah, there's yeah. that. But also it's the irony where it's like they can't just go and apply for these jobs. Right. They have to trick the rich people into giving them these decent jobs. Right. Everyone thinks, particularly in America, that there's going to be this beautiful home waiting for them once they are rich. But really the truth is that there's just going to be more room down in the hole for when they lose everything. You become so poor that you're forced to be a living ghost. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if stairs have ever been used so well in a movie. Oh, Not Jesus since Christ. Magnificent Ambersons, maybe. <laughs> Well, it's a great film. It won Best International Picture, which we all knew was going to happen or the heavens would fall. Yeah. And then it won all the other Oscars, too. Steph Hall writes, I was surprised by how much I loved The Two Popes. Seen it. Seen it. This is a story of two political rivals in the Catholic Church who develop a Pope-mance. <laughs> you know what they should have called this? Two many popes. <laughs> Too many popes. Too many popes. Yeah. I really enjoyed this movie. I was very compelled by it. It is kind of my dinner with Francis. <laughs> <laughs> even though we have separate dinners. Yes, even though they're separate dinners. It is an extended debate between two intensely intelligent people yeah. who want the same thing but going about it through different paths. A place where you can go that is not awful is our website, welcome to the basement show.com. All of our episodes are there, and that's the truth. And there are PayPal donation buttons where you can click on those and donate to support this show. What? One of them is Heather, who says, I've been struggling a lot with school, being sick, and seasonal depression lately, and watching Welcome to the Basement feels like hanging out with old friends. Hey, nice to hang out with you again, Heather. To find out who the rest of our donors are and to see the exciting contents of our mail crate, you can watch Unboxing, which is a completely separate show from this, and it comes out this coming Friday. I'll be there. Will you? Thanks for watching The Awful Truth with us, and now watch this. Well, every time I open the door, somebody walks in. Every time there's a knock at the door, there's a sentient person <laughs> making that noise behind it. I've always been expecting one of those... Things you attach to a door that just knocks, distract people. I think Pee Wee Herman used it in his big adventure.